Good evening and welcome to Southbridge School Committee meeting of Tuesday, May 8th, 2012. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. The Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Agenda item two, public input. Is there anyone from the audience that wishes to address the school committee? Good evening. Good evening. You just have to wait a minute, oh. Lauren, for it to. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Good evening. Uh, my name is Lauren McLaughlin, 71 Park Ave, Southbridge. And tonight I just want to address something that came up at our school council meeting last week at the Wells Middle School Council. Uh, Ms. Allen was, uh, was very excited to show us the plans for the new school. We were excited to see them. Beautiful. Look, everything looks great. She did mention, however, that there's talk to consolidate some services there that uh, were a concern to, I'll just speak for myself, but myself and some other people that were at that meeting. Specifically, there was talk, uh, Ms. Allen told us, about um, just having one nurse up at that building and to eliminate a guidance secretary position, so to consolidate the guidance. So in other words, as she explained it to us, and as I think I understood it, the, nurse, the nurse's office would be on either the high school or the junior high school side, and the guidance would be on either the junior high school or the high school side. But there wouldn't be a junior high school guidance office and a nurse, a junior high school nurse's office and a blah, blah, blah. I don't know if that makes sense. I don't know if that's accurate, but that was kind of how it was explained to us. And um, we just asked Ms. Allen um, how many people, for example, the school nurse at the Wells Middle School saw during a day. And she said that she thought it was around 50, was about how many students that Mrs. Cantara saw a day. And she guessed that at the high school it was about the same for Ms. Cheka. And the concern about that is if we're going to be going into a building and there's going to be uh, approximately 1,100 uh, students, 1,000 students there plus staff, to have one nurse to be managing all of that is a little bit problematic. But beyond that, um, I remember when even the building was being discussed in its infancy, there was a lot of talk about keeping services separate. Parents, especially at the younger level, were very concerned about their sixth graders interacting with the seniors, juniors and seniors at the high school. And as I understand it, if the nurse's office, if there is one nurse's office and there is one nurse, students either from the junior high school are going to have to go over to the high school side or the high school kids are going to have to come over to the junior high school side. And the same is true for guidance. And that was, a little, that was concerning to us. And I'll just tell you personally, um, both of my children have prescribed EpiPens. And uh, uh, rare though it would be to occur, um, just for example, if one of my children was on an athletic field, if one of my daughters was on an athletic field at one end of the school and was stung by a bee and needed an EpiPen, and my other daughter was in the cafeteria and ingested something she's allergic to, I worry about that. And it doesn't have to be my daughter's. I mean, it could be any child in any situation. So I just want to say that um, if that is true that that's under consideration, that I hope that that would be reconsidered and made a priority by the school committee. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Erin Quinney, 8 Crescent Street. Um, I had addressed the committee two weeks ago and handed in uh, complaints and action that I would like to be taken. And I was just wondering when I can anticipate hearing back given it's been two weeks. Well, as far as the issue that was referred to Mr. Ely, that's referred to the superintendent. We don't have any control over personnel issues mm -hmm. as a school committee uh, at that level. So certainly I'm not going to comment on what, if anything, Mr. Ely is going to do for a personnel matter. It is a personnel matter handled mm -hmm. by the superintendent, not for public information at this time. It's, it's with his hands. Okay. As far as the notice that you gave us, as far as school committee policy, I don't believe we have any jurisdiction over that policy issue. Specifically, you said that there were items that you believed he violated policy, but you didn't state within that letter any specific examples of it. 
and if, and furthermore, anything is to some of the things that you commented on, that, that, mm -hmm. that would be the people of, of, of the town that elected a member of the school committee. And if there was issues, that's taken up at the ballot box. So violation of the school committee members' ethics is not an issue that is addressed by the school committee? It's addressed by the voters? Is it's that a, it's, it, That's an ethics commission. If you believe that he violated an ethics law, therefore that's an ethics violation that would go to the state ethics board. I don't believe it was a ethics law that was violated. I believe it was the school committee members code of ethics as outlined in the school and committee it, policy that was violated. So my question is then if this is not the board to hold a school committee member accountable to that code of ethics to whom shall I address my concern? The voters of Southbridge. The s voters of Southbridge are responsible for... They, uh, they elect people to this board. And when they violate the code of ethics set by the school committee itself, I need to address the well, voters of Southbridge with well, my concerns? Well, you know what? I'm not going to get into a debate with I, you. I, I appreciate, yes, I appreciate, Mrs. Quinney, I appreciate your comments here tonight. Okay. We did refer it over to our attorney as mm -hmm. well. All right. And I have not received the response to that, that request, the specific request. Both mm -hmm. of your letters went to our attorney counsel that evening. Mm -hmm. Okay, I've not received a response, so I won't comment any further on it until I speak to our legal counsel. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Next. Wow. Tracy Chapowski, 5 Bowen Avenue. Can you restate your name because we didn't hear it? And he sure, needs to get sorry. Forward. Tracy Chapowski, 5 Bowen Avenue. Yep. Good evening. Um, I just wanted to echo what Laura McLaughlin had spoken about regarding the proximity of or the consolidation of the nurse and the guidance at the new school. Um, I did have the ability to tour it last month. Fantastic facility. Great, great. Looking forward to it very much. Um, but at the onset of the project, I was one of the, the town voters who was very concerned, or I should say very pleased with the decision to keep shared, shared central functions separate and distinct. And so I am somewhat concerned um, just given that the nature, beyond the, the points that Lauren raised, which were equally concerning from my point of view and certainly valid regarding just having the right um, availability of, of nurse and guidance, but the nature in particular, I think, with regard to the nurse and or the guidance, as you look to potentially a high school student who, per who perhaps had maybe stayed back, and I've run into quite a few high school students who seem to be older than what I would deemed to be the average high school age. And I know that my daughter in particular this year is a sixth grade student. Um, she met the cutoff by one day and pr I believe she is the youngest student in the entire sixth grade body, student body, and um, very shy. And, and when I think about how comfortable she is approaching the nurse about some of the changes that she might be experiencing or that things that are happening, and or the guidance, I think they're very different than the nature of some of the issues perhaps being discussed or brought to the high school nurse and guidance. So I would appreciate um, equal consideration. And I guess just um, in part of my ignorance here, I'm curious, what, what is the form by which these decisions are made? Would it be at this meeting here where there would be a dialogue around kind of how the decision moves forward with regard to the consolidation of a shared service function at the school? Or is there another form where perhaps um, townspeople can go and, and listen and participate and drive that dialogue? Uh, just as far as the budget process went, um, we had a budget subcommittee. Those meetings were posted for the development of our budget. Mm -hmm. The school administration presented their budget proposal to the school committee based on uh, their recommendations. That then went to a public hearing in which we advertise that public hearing, uh, both on our website and the newspapers. We're required by law to, to, to put that in the newspapers. Nobody attended that public hearing mm -hmm. to voice any input to that. As far as the nurse's position, I mean, we have to make certain decisions within that. Uh, personally, I was not aware until recently that we were going to a one nurse because I, I did not participate in those budget, cons uh, those budget discussions. But furthermore, what we will do is take the input that we have from the public we now have to go back anyway. This, the town council will be voting on our budget number within the next uh, week or so, and they'll, they'll give us a final number of what our budget's going to be. Right now, the town manager is anticipating cutting our recommended budget by $700,000. Mm -hmm. So we have to make some tough decisions as to what do we balance out for services as far as number of staff, people, mm -hmm. programs for all kids. 
on both ends. I mean, we have programs that we put into that budget for all uh, for uh, high-end learners, as far as within the, in the district, and as, as well as our special ed programs. So that whole gamut. So within the next week, we'll get that final number. Then we'll have to go back, and we may have to make some some further cuts within that budget. And so whether we can restore to two nurses at Wells, we wouldn't know that until we we sit around and. Uh, talk about the budget, but we will, uh, okay. the school committee will uh, put that date up of when we're going to discuss that budget. Okay. Uh, and most likely it will be a special school committee meeting of the whole to discuss the entire budget and make any necessary adjustments. Fantastic. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Is there anyone else from the? Scott Moriarty, 44 Maggie Lane. Uh, just stopping by, if, if anyone saw the town council meeting last night, it, it kind of made the same pitch there. Uh, more or less here primarily to advertise a couple uh, events for the Relay for Life that are coming up. Uh, certainly welcome and encourage uh, school committee members and, and everyone else to try to take part. Uh, one is Saturday, May 26, which is Memorial Day weekend. Uh, a wiffle ball tournament, we've done this several times uh, in the past, usually for a local girl with cancer. I know several of you have taken part in the past. Uh, and that's Saturday, May 26th. Uh, there's information on, on Facebook. You can just look it up uh, as, as What the Dickens Wiffle Ball Tournament. Uh, there's also some flyers down here at Town Hall. And secondly, uh, something that we're trying out the first time is basically what we call flag subscription service. So basically what we're doing is for the next four big patriotic holidays, uh, Memorial Day, Flag Day in June, Fourth uh, of July, and then Veterans Day. What we're looking for is basically somebody makes a $10 donation to the Relay for Life, American Cancer Society, uh, and we get a flag similar to this uh, that we'll put in your front lawn somewhere, uh, assuming that you have that uh, authority in case you're renting or whatever. Uh, so it r roughly comes down to four holidays. It's only $2.50 a holiday. It's not so bad. Uh, if anything, it's going to hurt us more with the gas that we have to spend driving all over the place. Uh, so that's on there as well. Um, and those are both you can find online, in the newspaper, that sort of thing. Uh, and then additionally, uh, on a separate topic, is, is obviously uh, I know a lot of people are probably here or, or watching tonight uh, because the state's here tonight. Uh, obviously, we hope it, it goes better than the last time they were here as far as some of the comments uh, and, and their feedback. But also, uh, just on my end of it, uh, for the school committee wise, I would hope that we were able to kind of just digest some of that information uh, before we kind of respond. I think last time, uh, for the most part, it was a little bit just kind of too much on the defensive, per se, rather than just kind of absorbing. Uh, but that's just from my own point of view. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moran. Anyone else from the audience who wishes to address the school committee? Anyone else? Anyone? Okay, seeing none, we'll call this meeting to order. Roll call, Mr. Secretary. Mr. DiGregorio? Present. Dr. Domenico? Present. Mr. Jovan? Present. Mr. Lazo? Present. Dr. O'Leary? Present. Mrs. Principe? Present. Mrs. Woodruff? Present. Seven present. <clears throat> item five, consent items. We have a warrant number 39 in the amount of $121,037.69. Uh, Is there a motion to move? Any discussion on that? Seeing none, roll call. Mr. DiGregorio? Yes. Dr. Domenico? Yes. Mr. Jovan? Yes. Mr. Lazo? Yes. Dr. O'Leary? Yes. Mrs. Principe? Yes. Mrs. Woodruff? Yes. Seven, yes. Yeah, and it's all present. Item six, approval of minutes of the regular school committee meeting of April 24th, 2012. Is there a motion? So moved. Any, any discussion, Eris? Dr. Domenico? I don't know, just my packet, but the minutes that are included uh, uh, were from the meeting before. They're not from the April 24th. They're from the April 10th. Yeah. No. We approved these minutes already. Yeah. So we'll table that and move it over to the next meeting. Thank you. Reports. Representative of the Student Advisory Committee, Helena Benoit. Good evening, Helena. Good evening. A lot is going on at the high school coming up. Class officer elections are May 10th. Many students are taking the AP exam this week and next week. 
Juniors have started taking their SATs or have registered. Math MCAS is the 15th and 16th of May. Prom, a night in Paris, is May 18th. This is also the last full day for seniors. Senior finals are May 21st to May 24th. Class day is May 25th. Chorus took first at their Bush Gardens competition this weekend. Chorus will have the end of the year concert on May 16th. The Honor Societies had a large number of inductions, inductees on the inductions on May 2nd. And teachers have started doing inventory for the future move that they are all looking forward to. Thank you, Helena. Helena, at that uh, Bush um, Gardens uh, competition that you were at, how many schools were there? There were six choruses in all. Six? Yes. And you came in first? Yes. Congratulations. Thank you. Job well done. I heard the kids were very, uh, had a great time, and it was a great time. <laughs> Presentations. Uh, first presentation this evening is our quarterly plan review for the second quarter with Dr. Mitchell and Dr. Bonder. Good evening. Welcome back. So thank you for welcoming, welcoming us again tonight um, to present at the school committee meeting the second quarterly progress report. Oh, I'm not making the That's all right. They, they won't uh, presentation. They, they won't show it. It's, it's not on TV yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, so as you know from the last time that we appeared before you, Dr. Banda has been working in the role of district monitor to um, learn and understand more about the district's ongoing efforts to implement an improvement plan to accelerate student achievement in the Southbridge Public Schools. So her work as monitor has continued this quarter as she has continued to meet monthly with Superintendent Ely and plan manager Mike Guinan and review information that she's received from them about the work that they're doing to implement the plan that was in place. This quarter, um, Dr. Banda has also attended district leadership meetings, visited schools, and expanded her review of what's happening in the system, including meeting with various staff members to understand the depth of implementation of some of these initiatives and the fidelity of implementation or the continuity in practice throughout the district. So the report that you will hear tonight will provide you an update on the work that has been done from January 2012 to March 2012. So it's important to remember that this report only contains report of that quarter um, to meet the goals of the plan that was in place um, at that time. So since then, there has been some um, work that uh, Southbridge has done on um, uh, uh, developing a new plan, and we'll speak to that after this presentation. But this quarter's report is just about the implementation of the goals in the plan that was in place at that time. You all have had a chance to receive the report and read it, correct? Correct. And so you'll notice as we discussed at the last time that we came before you that in this quarter we are also providing you with a snapshot of our assessment of the degree of progress that has been made in implementing the initi in each initiative and also the outcomes for each, each initiative. Um, because you've had a chance to read over the report, we're just going to provide a high-level summary for you and give you the opportunity to ask some questions about that. And then we'll go on to, after that to talk about the uh, next plan that Southbridge has been working on. Good evening. As uh, Ms. Mitchell has said, I'm just going to give you an overview of the report. I'm pleased to say that this quarter there's been progress, um, considerable progress on the plan. It's largely of a technical nature, but um, the things that have been implemented by Superintendent Ely and his leadership team are beginning to build on the systems of support that are already in place in the district. And we know that there's been a great deal of work that's been done over the last several years in the district. And that these supports are building on, are focusing on improved student achievement. Student growth will be addressed in the next quarterly report. So because this is largely technical implementation, 
we really didn't look carefully at student growth, but you'll hear more about that in the next report. As Ms. Mitchell said, I spent two days in the district. I attended a district leadership meeting, and I went to three schools. I interviewed each of the principals in the schools. I interviewed groups of teachers at each of the three schools. I uh, interviewed high school students, a group of high school students, and then I visited classes at each of those schools. So I really wanted to get a snapshot of what kinds of things were being done in the district and how people viewed what was being done. Some of my observations through those visits are that in classes, students are attentive and ready to learn. There are learning objectives that are posted in the majority of the classrooms, and that's terrific because that focuses both teachers and students on what will be learned during that particular lesson. It's kind of like going to a meeting and not knowing what the meeting is about if there aren't objectives posted. So that's something that, um, that is done and done, done well here. There are assessments that are evident in most classes. So teachers are checking for student understanding throughout the class. In classrooms where there's co-teaching, that is there's a regular teacher and then either a special ed teacher or an ELL teacher also in the classroom, I observed some, but not very much, co-teaching. So the ELL of the special education teacher would act as more of a support for the classroom teacher instead of acting as a co-teacher. So that co-teaching model is just beginning here and just beginning to grow. I saw very little tiered instruction, that is differentiation of instruction, and I saw very little of higher order thinking skills being required of the students. Um, I know these are areas that Superintendent Ely is addressing in professional development. The first strategic objective was to increase student achievement through outcomes focused development of high quality curriculum and instruction. And I'm pleased to say that there, is a, there are committees in place that are beginning to align the curriculum in both math and ELA, and that's being led by the district's curriculum team. There's also been a, pro a process that's begun to determine what professional development teachers are going to need to better respond to student learning, and then to develop a plan to provide that training. When Superintendent Ely came here, um, he instituted a walkthrough process that started in the spring of 2011. And that's something that is well valued in this district by administrators and teachers alike. Um, what happens is that groups of administrators walk through classrooms in a particular school and note areas, specific areas of instruction. They debrief as a team. They leave the principal with a list of what they saw that was working well and a list of areas for improvement. Some areas that have been identified and have been addressed through professional development include writing, student, writing content objectives and language objectives. And as I said, those are now evident in most classes. Student engagement, effective co-teaching, and higher order thinking skills. So those are being worked on, they've been identified, and they are being worked on. There has been professional development provided in the Keys to Literacy program, and beginning professional development provided in the Response to Intervention, or the RTI program. That was first rolled out to special education staff and we're hoping to see it continue to be rolled out to all teachers in the district because that will help with that tiered instruction. And as you know, Superintendent Ely and his team have been working on developing the Southbridge Standard, which is a guide to high quality instruction in Southbridge. Strategic objective number two is productive collaboration and shared responsibility for all stakeholders through team building. This is in the early stage of development. The curriculum teams have been formed, but there are no products yet from these teams. There are data teams in all the schools, but there are different stages of development. So for example, at the middle school and the high school, they're just beginning where at the Charlton Street School, they've been in effect for a number of years. The district data team has defined a cycle of inquiry and shared that with the schools. The, um, 
The goal now is to take that data and to use it to improve student achievement and to narrow the performance gap. One of the questions that I ask to each group who I visited with is, is there a sense of urgency in Southbridge in terms of helping all students be prepared academically? And everyone answered with a resounding yes, including the students. I asked them where that came from, and they told me that it started with the last superintendent, that it has been continued through this superintendent, that they hear it from all of the administrators in the district and from teachers in the district. So there's a unified sense here that improving student achievement is very important. Strategic objective number three is mutual accountability for all stakeholders. There was benchmark testing done this year. The DRA was given in some grades. Dibbles was given in grades K to five. The Galileo was done in the fall and in the winter in both ELA and math in grades two to five. And the Galileo was given only in math in grades six to 10 and only in the fall. We're unclear at this point how the benchmarks will be integrated into the new achievement network work that's going to be introduced next year. And um, but Superintendent Ely has uh, assured me that he's working for a seamless transition. So we'll be looking forward to seeing that. <coughs> Excuse me. And the superintendent also tells me that there'll be training and coaching that will be provided to all teachers in terms of how to use data to inform instruction. And that's the important part of it. We can collect all the data we want, but if we're not using it well to inform instruction, it's not doing us any good. So we're looking forward to that whole process. The, um, the walkthroughs that are being done by administration have become a welcome part of the culture, and they're about to be expanded to teachers, and we think that will be very effective. The superintendent has developed a district-level instructional leadership team that is presently addressing the issues of the accelerated improvement plan. Uh, it's on the top of everybody's list, and that's very exciting. As the district works through the accelerated learning, uh, accelerated improvement plan, there are many concepts, new concepts that are being introduced. Some of these may be new to principals, and we have cautioned the district that there may have to be much more direct professional development for principals and other administrators within the district. We want principals to be able to monitor what's being done in classrooms, and want to be, we want them to be able to monitor effective instruction. So they may need more direct professional development, ongoing support, and monitoring of what they're doing will be critical. In conclusion, Southbridge in this quarter has made a serious effort to improve, to, excuse me, to implement its accelerated improvement plan. The technical aspects of many parts of the plan are now in implementation stage. It's now important that the superintendent ensure that principals and central office administrators are equipped with the tools that they need to lead their schools and the district. And it's important in the next quarter that principals and central office administrators are held accountable with concrete goals that are continuously revisited and monitored by the superintendent. It's the superintendent's responsibility to lead this effort. As well, the district needs to ensure that changes are impacting learning at the classroom level, that teachers are held accountable for needed changes in practice, and that student achievement results are not only documented, but also analyzed in order to inform next steps. The voice of the school committee in supporting this plan is essential. The plan can only be accomplished by a joint effort of all of those involved in the governance of the school district. Before we go on to talk about the new plan that uh, Superintendent Ely and his leadership team have been working on, and our evaluation of that. We're wondering if you have any questions about the report this quarter that you'd like to ask at this time. Any questions? Mr. DeGregorio? I'm, I'm just curious, uh, in speaking with the students, was there any negative feedback? Was there anything that they felt that 
was lacking. The students um, were very interesting. One of the things that they talked about is high expectations for all students. And that was, that was one of the things that they wanted to make sure occurred in the school district and continued to occur in the school district. Um, they also talked about um, guidance towards the next steps. So um, as much support as possible and trying to determine what they will do when they get out of high school. You know, which, um, should they go on to college? Which colleges are best for them? So they're looking for a very uh, interactive guidance program as well. So those are two main things they talked about. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Dr. O'Leary. Uh, hi, ladies. Thank you for your uh, uh, time and continued uh, input with us. So you articulated a, a great number of things that uh, seem to be on the positive side. Uh, if in the, in the spirit of uh, education here, could, are you able to give us a progress report in a grade A through F? It's valid. It's valid, guys. I'm sorry, a, a progress report on effort? No, no A through F. Oh, from A to F. Well, that's what we get in progress reports, right? Our kids get them every day. We all had them. Right. So, so, uh, so we're, we're not sure if an A to F rating is, is appropriate, but what we have done in this report is to, on page, this is the last page in the report, page 8, we have described the different stages that we have learned improvement processes go through and provided for each initiative where we have found Southbridge Public Schools to be in the implementation of that initiative, right? So there were no, there were no areas that were problematic. There were no areas in the plan that received the lowest sort of the stage, which would be problematic or at-risk implementation. So that's a good thing. Yeah. Now, when we look at the other stages of implementation, we recognize that things, in order for things to, I'm sorry? Yeah. In order for things to be done well, implemented well in a, in a, in a sizable way at scale, the first step is typically tec technical implementation. And that's where we've seen most initiatives to be at at this point. Well, that's appropriate. If you're still at that stage of technical implementation a year from now, that's not where you want to be. So we're hoping that we will see as we come back on um, progress in moving from technical implementation to the practices in place stage of implementation. And where we're headed is fully embedded so that it, these more effective practices have a life of its own. Um, we've also provided, if you look at the second column of that table, um, performance ratings. So we have four kinds of performance ratings from performance goals not reached to performance goals partially reached to reach performance goals and then to reach high performance goals consistently. So you'll also see that besides an improvement prog process rating, which really talks about the work moving forward, We've also uh, described the results that you're getting based on what we've learned from um, the, the information that, that we've gotten so far. Thank you. Thank you. Further questions? Dr. That's Domenico? Fine. Yes, knowing that uh, we are being evaluated, or that this progress report evaluates the progress on an implementation plan that was not accepted by the state as an appropriate, how useful were the exercises on which we are being su successful currently yeah. in the implementation of the new and better and hopefully yeah. a plan that will be approved? So, so that's, a, that's a really good question. So maybe it's time now to make a transition um, to talk about the uh, next plan. So the, the reason that, the main reason that the first plan um, did not quite meet the expectation of the department is that it wasn't clear enough from that old plan that the work to accelerate improvement in Southbridge Public Schools would occur fast enough and achieve high enough results. And so in the, so we, we have to recognize that what we've seen so far is a good start on a plan that for us didn't go quite fast enough or deep enough 
to get the kind of results that we know that you're expecting for Southbridge Public Schools. Now since then, um, Superintendent Ely and his uh, leadership team and working with Mike Guinan and the department have put together a new plan that does go further and deeper and faster. And so one thing that we've had the opportunity to do is to learn about some of the work that uh, the superintendent was thinking about that we needed to establish an agreement about on paper so that we could say, this is the plan that we can agree to, that we can report back to you all on, that will get Southbridge where it needed to be. So for example, this new plan has a greater emphasis on data now, really looking at it carefully to make sure, are we getting the results that we're looking for, and if not, Let's, what are the mid-course corrections we need to make so that we can get the results. The new plan has more targeted uh, professional development for um, educators and also has steps to build the capacity of administrators so that they can be better instructional leaders. Um, we also now see in this plan steps to engage the parents and community in ways that can um, help them support their children in partnership with Southbridge Public Schools, which, which is a, 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 a new area that once it's in the plan, will open the door for us to also speak with parents to understand how that work has resulted in um, a better experience for them and their children and getting what they need out of the system. And we also saw that the elements in the old plan that were valuable have been retained and strengthened. We, have, we see now that there are more uh, specific action steps that we can have confidence in that will achieve the ex objectives and the benchmarks are more measurable. So there are a, a few places that we are going to be uh, speaking uh, with your uh, uh, superintendent about later just to um, make sure that we have nailed some of the benchmarks. So for example, specific benchmarks on subgroups for graduation, promotion, um, and performance. Um, but we feel like we have a plan in place that will move Southbridge forward and we'll be back here in the next quarter and on an ongoing basis to report to you on, uh, on that progress and provide the kind of feedback that we hope that um, you all find helpful in your governance role that, and that will also support the uh, superintendent in um, his uh, lonely role of uh, leading the district um, in this uh, aggressive way and also the, communicate with um, the others here working really hard in Southbridge Public Schools to help them understand how their individual efforts are leading to this progress. So that, that's a long way of answering the question. Did, did I actually answer the question? <laughs> I'll just wait next three months and see what happens then. <laughs> okay. I, I just wanted to add to that that the, the previous plan, the first plan, is maybe necessary but not sufficient. So it, was, um, it certainly has helped the district to begin the technical implication, implementation of the aspects of this plan. The second plan will be deeper and it will go further. So this has not been time wasted. Mr. Lazo. Um, Dr. Mitchell and Dr. Bond, I just want to welcome you to Southbridge and it's a pleasure to hear what we're hearing here. I, I sense a different, uh, a diff different atmosphere uh, compared to the last uh, update. I, I, I like the words feedback, communicate, um, adapt to change. I think we're all, my fellow colleagues and I can speak for the board that we are all in it for the same reason. How we get to the finish line is sometimes uh, puts it to work, puts it to the test. Our superintendent I know works diligently on, on what the accomplishments are and where we're headed and it's nice to hear that the, the old plan, some of the things were um, viable and saved and then you know we can adapt to the new changes so I think this whole team concept being implemented uh, from DESC and the Southbridge School System is refreshing. I welcome it and I want to continue to, to work together. Thank you. Anyone else? Well thank you for being here tonight. It is a much uh, better report but we all know that this is just one step in the long road that we've been taking. Um, it's nice to hear that that our students have gotten the message that there's a sense of urgency. 
and the fact that they, they wish to have um, uh, raise other children to higher expectations as well. I think that's a compliment to, to the kids that we have in this system. Uh, and I know certainly um, some of the kids in the high school have really tried to impart that in the, the kids that are following them to say that, that school's important. Um, and I look forward to working with you in regards to this um, and uh, adapting with, with us on the program. Now, my one question that I have is, you have a new plan that's been submitted to you. What's the timeline for getting final approval to say, yes, this is the plan, this is our, our framework or how we're gonna move forward? What's that timeline to get that approved? So you can consider the plan approved. We're just gonna add a couple of benchmarks. Okay. All right, very good, thank you. Thank you for being here tonight. Appreciate it, thank you. Our next presentation this evening is on the food service program and proposed 2012-2013 school lunch prices. Mr. Wiggins, Mrs. Pinkham, good evening. Hello everyone, thanks for having me tonight. I'd like to uh, give you uh, a general overview of how, the, how things have gone this year. Um, I think for me, being my first year, I think things have gone pretty well. Um, there's a, a lot of opportunity here to um, make some good changes, and uh, it's been uh, very rewarding for me this year. I really want to thank my staff, first of all, because they've been wonderful to work with. Um, Shirley and my managers and all of the staff, they're a very dedicated uh, group of workers. Um, so some of the things that we've done this year, we've done some kitchen inspections. Um, we have uh, spent some time uh, focusing on an increased use of diversion products. Does everyone know what a diverted product is? That may not know what sure. a diversion product uh, diver is. A uh, diverted great. product is um, uh, manufacturers that uh, the government allots us so much in allocation every year in different groups, and it would be companies like Tyson and Michael Foods and um, just those types of um, companies that you're already familiar with. And then we are able to make those selections and we get, um, we get a reduced price for that. So it's to our benefit and we've tried to use as much of that as possible this year. Um, another thing that we've done is we, are, we have introduced some new menu items, uh, including some whole grain items. Um, another thing that our group has done is uh, we're using the virtual gateway. So we were part of the pilot program, and um, while it took a while for us to get uh, to, to use that, it's actually very helpful now, and that helps us to determine uh, free students, actually, for our program. Um, we've also conducted some regular management meetings. Um, I'm trying to foster teamwork, collaborating with the managers on actually making the menu, um, and I've provided some uh, manager um, professional development education. Um, we've also conducted, or, or we've all undergone food allergy training, and that was a requirement that we needed to do. Um, we've had some serve safe recertifications and one certification. Um, we have also implemented um, state uh, production records. We were um, using an older form, so now everyone is on board with the new form. We've also um, updated task lists where things were in, in handwriting before. We've put them uh, into a Word format, and from there we can look at um, actually what we're doing, when we're doing, and, and how we're doing it. So that's helped us a great deal. So that's in general. With regards to the um, elementary school food service, we kept things pretty much the same. Um, we did have to purchase a new warming unit for Eastford Road that was not working at all and could not be repaired for an appropriate cost. Um, and then we did make some changes to the breakfast program. What I found is that um, we were kind of doing different things at different schools, and so I felt that in order to control costs, 
um, and also to be compliant with um, the uh, nutrition standards, we needed to make a few changes. So um, we've done that, and I probably will be looking at that again. Um, always want to be looking at the acceptance of the particular food items that we're offering to the, the students. So, um, but we did make a, a, a good progress with that. In terms of what we're going to be doing next year with the reconfiguration, I think we're going to have menus that are very similar. I actually like the fact that we're doing the majority of the cooking actually at the schools. Most of the products are the ready to bake um, uh, protein type items, fro some frozen vegetables, some canned vegetables, some fresh fruits, some canned, uh, or some fresh fruits um, and um, canned fruits, of course. But I think that we're going to stick with that model because the, um, when we can cook it on site, we're, we're, we're not degrading the quality. When we have to ship things around, you have to have the right tools in order to do that. And maybe that's something that we can get to down the road. But for now, I think what we're doing is good. We just need to expand on it. And we need to have the right equipment uh, to be able to, to continue with that. So again, the, the plan going forward for next year is to have the, um, I'm gonna make sure that we have the right equipment and the right amount of staffing for the reconfiguration. And the other thing that we'll look at is the um, fresh fruits and vegetables uh, snack program to see, um, I, I believe we qualify for that, so it's just a matter of getting that implemented. That will be a good thing for our elementary schools. Um, so, uh, in terms of the individual elementary schools, um, with your plan, uh, Eastford Road will have a reduced number of uh, students, I believe. So, the present staffing, we have a manager, we have several helpers and a custodian, and we have the, the standard equipment, uh, convection oven, warming unit, uh, refrigerator, freezer. Um, storage racks and a dish machine. What we need to do next year is we need to really look at the, uh, the staffing to see what we're going to tweak. If we're going to have serve less students, we're going to look at that. Um, and then in terms of the equipment, the, the big change that I'd like to see down the road would be to get um, an upright freezer because right now we have chest freezers in most of the smaller schools and those really need to be a, a two-door type upright um, a configuration and then uh, we would like to get at some point uh, storage that we can clean under roll around and lock so that will be um, on the agenda for the future when the the budget will allow for that in terms of Charlton and West Street again the again the um, staffing is very similar um, and the equipment is very similar um, so certainly with an increased number of students, we definitely will need to look at uh, the staffing as well as the equipment there. And um, what I am hoping for is that we're going to end up with, uh, let's say, an additional lunch period because that way we can pr most likely maintain our present number of staff, perhaps just increase their hours for the additional preparation, and perhaps the an expanded lunch period, and that I think would work the best. That's great. That's that's good news. Um, and then in terms of the equipment, we're not a hundred percent right now, especially at West Street. Our, in terms of the cooking there, the the convection oven we have there is Lynn really does her best to try to. Um, get all the foods ready and she does that every day but we actually uh, we are going to need additional uh, equipment of, of all types there we're at both schools we're going to need a, an additional convection oven we really will need more refrigeration again the freezer space that we have now is so limited so we'd like to get an upright freezer um, the the rolling storage racks and at Charlton Street School, we need to make sure that our, our dish machine, we need to look at the dish machine, because right now it isn't operational, hasn't been for quite some time, um, but we, we're going to assess that. So um, those are the types of things that we'll be looking at for the elementary schools. In terms of the, the middle school, um, the satelliting, again, as I had previously said, for this year has been primarily the ready-to-bake items the um, things in, in cans, frozen foods and, and whatnot. What we have done in terms of the preparation that's done at Wells and then satellited to the 
elementary schools has been primarily salads and sandwiches. And I see that again as continuing for next year. In terms of the high school, um, I think everyone knows that we're in the process of a pilot program with the, uh, the lunch line. The goals of this were to provide a greater selection to all of our customers. We've been able to do some um, menu and recipe testing, and we've also, it gives us the opportunity to do some production planning for next year. Um, for next year, um, we're hoping that we're going to have, we will be having an increased number of entrees, vegetables, and fruits offered to the students, so there'll just be a greater selection all around. Um, the entrees will be, uh, there will be a main hot entree, an alternate hot entree, a hot sandwich, a, uh, or this is what we're doing now, a hot, a hot sandwich, choice of three deli cold grinders, um, a main salad, and a wrap sandwich. So basically, um, kind of six, six different um, components. We are considering the grinders as one. And then uh, the vegetables, what we've done with that is we're trying to increase the different types of offerings. So before we were offering a tossed salad every day, now we're trying to mix it up with putting some carrots out, some celery, uh, three bean salad. We're gonna see how that's going. And um, we also increased the type of fresh fruit that we're offering right now. And actually, that, that, the, the fruit has really gone up. So that was the, the biggest, uh, best news I could have had in the last couple of weeks that um, Nick had said to me that the fruit consumption is really, really um, improving. So I think that the folks that were patronizing the a la carte line were not necessarily selecting a fruit when they were purchasing a meal. And now it's part of the meal. So that, that's really, um, that's been a, a good, great benefit. Um, and we're, we're presently monitoring every day our, our leftovers, and we've had very little leftover, and that's been an ongoing thing. We're into the third week already, so we're, we're considering most of our days successful. And I do have to thank um, Nick and Marie for uh, managing um, this, as well as the rest of the staff. They've really done a great job with this new change. It was a very big change, and it's, it's been successful. So planned for next year for the, the new middle high school, again, for breakfast, we would be offering milk, juice, fruit, cereal, yogurt, um, cheese sticks, and some whole grain pastries. We've started with some whole grain pastries this year, and I will, again, keep monitoring the acceptance of that. Um, and as we learn, as the uh, food vendors get more savvy to what our needs are, they keep trying harder. Um, with uh, different offerings, so we're going to definitely keep abreast of that. The plans for next year, how the um, cafeteria is actually laid out, there are four, um, there's four stations. Um, on the, there's a hot entree station for our, our sort of main offerings, and along with that would be the where the dessert would go, the, the cold fruit and perhaps a cold salad. Then there is a salad station, there's a deli station, and on the far end, there is another hot table where I believe that there is a, um, um, uh, a hot surface and there will be a grab and go. So the hot surface would be f for something like pizza and calzone and uh, the grab and go for s hot sandwiches. All parts of whatever we're selling on that on the line will be available on an a la carte basis. So if someone wants to buy just one extra item, they'll be able to do that. Um, in addition to that, we'll have uh, snack type items available, soups and the water and uh, beverage type items, which we presently do now as well. So in, in terms of how things are going to flow for next year, um, the way that it can work is people can enter actually from either side of the cafeteria and sort of scatter through the various stations and then they would exit through the center where the cashiers are. So enter from either side, choose the station that they want and exit through the middle. They do not have to go in a straight line and wait in a long line. They can pick what they want and come out. I, too, I told Sue I'd jump in here and take credit for the worst slide in the presentation. Um, and, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through the details, but what this is for the committee to look at 
and I think you can read it in your uh, pieces better, is one of the things we are doing, of course, is we're taking two food service organizations, we are melding them into one. And we're basically creating all new positions. But we're creating a new model as well. And the model we are doing is really somewhat of a restaurant model in that if you think about the building leadership, if you will, for the new middle high school cafeteria, it is going to have a back of the house chef manager. And that person's job is to make sure that food production is out there, is good, is quality, is meeting the standards, not just the standards that we need to meet for child nutrition, but the standards that we want to meet for having a product that our students want to eat, that our staff wants to eat. Then there will be a front of the house manager who is going to be probably the person who will handle things like some of the inventory, managing how we're doing the service, managing some of the things, some of the other staff operations and that sort of thing. Really kind of splitting that operation much like a restaurant would do. And then flowing from that, there are a couple of assistant cooks, there are some prep servers, there are some cashiers, there is a custodian, there is a driver because we will still be satelliting from this uh, operation. The key thing when you get to the bottom line is that there's in the, sa in the hours saved when we create this new organization, there's about 46 hours saved. One of the things we would like to do because of the demands of some of the things of the new virtual gateway and also the fact that we of this year have seen the need and we think there will be a need in this new organization to have sort of a permanent sub that will be available if we have people out sick or whatever, is to create sort of a permanent sub position that if they're not needed will be working on our free and reduced lunch uh, uh, students and the processing of applications and that sort of thing. Uh, so we've incorporated that position as a new position in there. There is still a net savings that would translate into saving the overall program costs. Roughly about, I think it's around, uh, if I remember, 90, 9350, thank you. It's way at the bottom of my computer, so I can't see it on my computer even. So that shows you how bad the slide is. Sir, can I just ask you a question on the slide? Sure. Um, what time does breakfast start at the middle school or middle school and high school in the morning? Do you know? Right, right now, seven o'clock for the high school. I'm not 100% on the middle school. But my question is, um, looking at the staffing levels here, you only have one prep server for breakfast at 7 a.m. That one person is going to be able to accommodate a thousand students for breakfast. I mean, what's at at, and again, one of the things I said is sort of description working. I probably should have put that under hours as well, okay? We, we understand that the hours, we're going to probably have to flex a little bit in here. Um, but I would tell you that for the most part, if we're going to flex hours on one end, we're also going to probably be able to flex, be able to flex them somewhere on the other end. Okay, understandable. I just want to make sure that this accurately reflects what we need up there. Sue and I have spent a lot of time on this. We've actually we've talked with uh, a little bit about this with the well, actually a lot with the uh, uh, current manager up there at the high school. Um, talked with the manager at Wells, um, and again, it's one of those things that we're pretty comfortable with this plan going in. Obviously, when we see, you know, how it works, uh, you know, nothing is perfect. So we understand we may have to tweak this a little bit. Um, and quite frankly, if we have to tweak it, it's going to mean we're successful. No, and our goal is to have it successful. I mean, uh, the two managers, are those new positions or are those positions that we currently have management in, in those buildings? We have one at Wells and we have one at the high school now. As managers? As managers. Okay, thank you. Just one other comment on the breakfast. We don't get as much breakfast participation as we do at lunch, so that's why there's also reduced staffing. But it's, it will continue to be a focus, and I certainly would like to increase our breakfast number. So 
uh, we'll keep an eye on that. Can Mrs. Woodruff would like to ask a question as well? Okay. Um, so what you're telling me is, or telling us, is the two managers are staying and moving up to the new building and everybody else is a new hire? Or how uh, are you laying people off at the end of this year and putting new positions in? How are you working the people we actually, have? Actually, Sue and I met with the union approximately a month ago. And we indicated that what we were doing is we were considering these all new positions and that everyone was going to apply new. They have actually submitted applications. We indicated that we are interviewing our people first. So we expect that we will probably fill most of these positions with our people unless there is some performance issue. If there is a performance issue, that person may not be hired for the new school. Okay, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you, Mr. Woodruff. Okay. Okay, and then uh, um, moving on to the summer meal program, um, the sites that we'll be having this year are um, Eastford Road, West Street, Charlton, the high school, the Grow School, the library, the um, Armory Community Center, and then uh, Brookside Terrace Apartments and the YMCA. Um, the what I've learned this year is that the success of these summer programs is really um, intertwined with the program's ability to have a recreational and or educational program. If you have a standalone um, feeding site, it's likely, it's likely not to be as successful as those that are joined with something else. And I give the example of West Street. Apparently you had um, a recreational program at West Street in the past and it was discontinued and you can see that the numbers have dramatically dropped. So I know there was talk about looking into that again this year for that particular school and conversely the library held a summer reading program and for their first year they, they did quite well uh, with the participation rate. The menu will probably be very much the same as what it was last year. I always want to focus on variety, and I will try to accommodate some individual requests if, if at all possible. We get to transition into the numbers now. Nope, that's okay. That's, that's no problem, okay. Um, these are numbers you've actually seen before, okay? Um, and when we look back at the summer meal program and we look at the meal counts, in 2009 you had total meal counts of 48.74. It increased in 2010 to 67.39. And then in 2011, this past year, it increased to 98.92. So it's been steadily increasing in the meal counts that you've had. Now, one of the things I want to tell you and as you see the next set of numbers, I, I'm going to tie this in to the, the, the cash, if you will. Um, one of the things we found out in meeting with the state, um, uh, was it last week that we met with the state on the summer meeting program? I, I think it was last week, yeah. A, a, at any rate, one of the things we found out is that there had been an assumption that this had to be limited to a six-week program. It does not. And last year, our biggest site basically was cut off its final two weeks because there was a thought that it had to cut off. And there was basically two more weeks of service that we could have had at our most successful site. Keep that in mind for just a second. In 2009, you lost $15,000. Part of the reason you lost $15,000 is because the model in 2009 was where we not only prepared the food and delivered the food, we served the food. We have been evolving to a model where we don't serve the food anymore. The site trains its own people to serve the food. In 2010, you cut that dramatically to $6,493. Still a loss. Last year, we cut it to $2,197. Now, in August, the, the August part of that loss was $393. With two more weeks at your most successful site, that would have been approximately, I believe, somewhere around 400 more meals. I, I can't honestly promise that because I don't know the, the actual per meal numbers, but I think you would have come close to either breaking even or making money in August. And it's not a program that's designed to obviously make a profit, but for the first time in the history of this program, we actually run it 
at a length of time that we could have, even for that one site, it actually could have been profitable for that one month. Now, I put at the bottom of this when I was putting together the outline for Sue, planning on two more years. That's a note for me, but it is also something that I wanted to mention to you. Why I said this to Sue and why I wanted to bring this up to you is that I understand the concern of the committee and it is a very justifiable concern. You, you can't continue to lose this kind of money on a program. It's not a program that's designed to make money, but again, you can't lose money on a program either. And the state was told that in pretty blunt terms when we met with them. However, the reason I'd like to see this program go at least two more years is this is going to be a weird year. It just isn't normal with everything that's going on. And I think it's an aberration, including the fact that we would like to try and see what it is like with those sites that are now going into their second year, the Y and the library in particular, that are very successful sites, that are sites that provide the servers, okay, that will have extended period. And then to get through this aberration year and then next summer, 2013, quite honestly, that's the year where we should have our act together. I will have a food service director who is experienced with the district, who has experienced the summer program. I will have experienced the summer program here in Southbridge, even though I've done it before in other districts. I haven't experienced here yet uh, fully. Uh, because of when I came in last year. We will have the new school online. We will be satelliting from there. There's a whole number of reasons that I would really encourage the committee to allow us to continue the program for two more years. Yep. Balances. Could we just have a discussion sure. about this summer Absolutely. food feeding program? Given the fact that we are reconfiguring the entire district and we're going to be moving facilities to a new middle school, high school, in your professional opinion, I value your opinion. Is it, is it practical to try to f do a summer feeding program with all these distractions that we have in the district? I, I, do, I do believe it is, and I think the state is also you know, stepping up and trying to find ways to help us. They were working with us to try and, and find an intern. We thought we had one lined up. That did fall through. They're still willing to work with us to try and find help. Um, there are, there are some grants which unfortunately we did miss out on. There are some other funds that may become available to us. Um, I think, and again, I, I admit an emotional attachment here. I, I admit my, my prejudice here, if you will. I think it's a valuable program. I know you do too, okay? Um, and I know the challenge is that as valuable as it is, it's with, with declining revenues and, and declining budgets, it's just not something that can easily be absorbed, you know, particularly by a food service program that is recovering, you know, from a situation where it just simply doesn't have the fund balance that other food service programs have that could absorb this. Um, and that's a really, that, that's the real challenge that we face here in Southbridge. But I do believe we can do it. Um, you know, Sue and I have been meeting with the state. Um, you know, I have confidence in Sue. She has picked up food service incredibly fast. Um, she has an experienced team who has done this. Um, the sites that last year were first year sites, now are veteran sites. So they are experienced. Um, uh, we met, Chris Clark was part of the meeting. The town wants to work with us to help us do it. So I mean, I think there's, there's a lot of reasons to believe we can be successful doing it, even with all the other things we've got going on. Okay, and, and Sue is entirely correct. The, Mr. Vesha used to run that, that program up at the uh, West Street School, and they had a lot of kids that, that participated in that, and that was a big loss. So are you saying that there's no grant now? We're, we had grants in the past couple of years, but there is no grant, is that what you're saying? Or, one, or, or? one of the things we did find out in our state meeting is apparently, and. There had been some communication issues, those have been straightened out, but apparently there were some grants that did come up in February, they didn't get communicated, both to the town and school. Um, we missed some of them. That has been straightened out. There are some other things, however, that may be coming up, so. Were those the grants that we used in the last two years for this program, or are those different grants? The di one of them was a different grant, so. Yeah, I don't think we had any grants in the past, so. So I know in the past we had to take a vote, though, to participate in the program. It was by a certain date. Um, 
We in the last two years, I do remember that I believe that we had to take a vote by the school committee to participate in the summer uh, feeding program. And I, I, it was my recollection that Courtney had to apply for, for something through the state for this program. There is an application. Um, the application has, because we regularly file for grants, so the application has been filed. Um, they had not indicated to us that we need any formal vote from you, but certainly I think it would probably be wise if you folks, perhaps at your next meeting, took a vote, um, certainly to give us guidance because it has been a topic of discussion uh, among the committee. Okay. But you don't really, you're not really required to. There is no legal requirement for you to do that. Well, I believe that the reason we took a vote is because of the fact that we, uh, there is a cost to the district and it's our, our responsibility for budgeting purposes and it's finance. So if we're going to incur, incur a cost to the school district, then I would be, say that it does require a school vote to expend funds from the school district. It's our staff that's participating in this based on a reimbursement by the state. I think part of it is the way the state defines this particular fund the, because of the uniqueness of the school lunch fund because the school lunch fund is the one fund that's defined by state law that if it ran into a deficit that is considered okay by the state. I'm not saying I'm saying it's okay. Please make it clear a difference between what the state says is okay and what I am saying is okay. Okay, that would never be our intention. But that's why they don't have a necessarily a legal requirement for us to put in the application. Mrs. Prince, Mrs. Prince, you have a question? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Last year, there was a big effort by the state and by the, the people involved with Project Bread on the state level right. to form an ad hoc committee that involved many community members. Um, Mr. Ely was on it, I was on it, the police department was on it, and they were very active in, in trying to keep this alive. And it was at the, those meetings that we recognized that to have a summer feed program, something has to accompany it, accompany it like, a, like a recreation. That's why the library got involved. And um, I think we did very well last year considering. I mean, we fed almost 10,000 meals versus two years ago, 4,800. My question this year, is how involved is the state in Project Bread? I mean, they were so gung-ho and talked about grants and they would meet with us when the time came next year for the grants. Has that, any of that happened? Project, Project Bread is involved, okay. We did meet with Project Bread. Um, I think one of the things that, again, was a problem this year was there was, there was some miscommunication, you know, early on. Okay, that's been corrected. We did have a meeting with, with um, uh, representative of Project Red. In fact, that was part of the meeting we had last week. Okay, police are involved, town is involved, library is involved, YMCA is involved. That's actually where we got some clarification, where everybody was surprised. For example, when we found out we did not need to limit it to six weeks, okay, because of the fact that most districts, for example, did not have snow days this year. Most districts are starting their program earlier, okay, because most, a lot of the summer programs are starting earlier because, of course, the school districts are not going later. So there's a, there, there definitely is, an, is involvement and interest in the state to have this because, again, a community such as Southbridge, where there is high need, they have a very strong interest in the program going forward. Um, I think it's very clear to say that uh, there was certainly a spirit of partnership between the town you know, and the school in that meeting. I think that it's very clear that I think the folks at Project Bread and at the state understand that we have a new food service director and they want to do everything they can to be supportive of her, okay? They also are very clear, at least I think I made it very clear, Sue can certainly jump in if she thinks I was vague, um, that we do have some challenges this summer, which is one of the reasons we need a little extra support, um, and also that this can't continue to lose money. It doesn't have to make money, but it can't continue to lose money. Thank you. Any other questions? Continue. Broader program. You'll remember back in the summer when I was first here, one of the first reports I gave you was what our fund balance was for last year. 
and it did increase from the year before um, to about 16,000 and change. As of our last report, and actually we, we were working on it today and it's held pretty much the same. We don't have, not a formal re update for tonight, but the number is basically held level, so it's, this is still a good number, okay? Um, we're at $51,026. So we've grown that fund balance so far this year pretty well, and that's through a lot of hard work by a lot of people. Sue, certainly, um, our kitchen managers, the entire staff has worked very, very hard. Um, and they all deserve a lot of credit. You know, it's nice when it happens on the business manager's watch, but to be honest with you, you know, other than maybe every once in a while doing nudging, it's really the work that they do. This will go down a little bit as we get towards the end of the year, but I think it's safe to say that the fund balance will continue to grow. That's obviously what we want it to do. One of the things that I think is important that the committee, and maybe more importantly the public understand, is that the state and federal government want a food service to have approximately three months average operating costs as your fund balance so that, for example, when you need a new van, when you need to replace a warmer, when you need to buy an upright two-door freezer, you have the funds to do that. Well, for us, our target is $300,000. So we're not there yet. So while $50,000 certainly is, you know, great progress, everybody needs to understand that we have a ways to go. So, um, Again, I commend the work that everybody has done. We're moving in the right direction. I don't want to you know, uh, belittle it, but we need to keep in perspective that, again, as we have all of these discussions, you know, there is a, a place that we need to be, and we've still got a long ways to go to get there. It's not July 1, 2012. That's from last year. It is. It's July 1, 2011. Okay. Okay. So this is not projected for no, this year. No, it's not year projected. Ending. It's okay. not projected. It's from last year. Very good. That's, that's okay. Yeah. If, if you'd seen the first uh, yeah. slide of the schedule, Sue caught me having people work from 7 a.m. to 1.30 a.m. Oh, yeah. And that was wrong, too. So, all right. I apologize. Thank you. Yes. Mr. Wiggins, this, this was um, a discussion that took place on the, the last meeting that yes. stood some controversy. Um, this was the, the point that I was trying to make about the express line making money. Mm -hmm. um, not that you have to make money in some of these programs, um, and I understand breaking even would be fine, providing quality food. I really commend our food service director as, as a nutritionist and putting good food out, and I'm, I'm behind that 100%. I visited the food service area, had lunch, Terry was there. Uh, what concerns me, and I'm optimistically cautious over this whole thing, every time um, I've been through seven food service directors, um, some good, some not so good. Uh, we've seen good food, we've seen average food, and we saw some not so good food. And I, and I, and I commend you, Sue, you've, you've brought the quality up, and, and I'm not debating that at all. But I'm cautiously uh, moving forward with this, and I hope we can continue this. I'm very well aware of the new school and what we have for a facility coming online. But if we have $51,000, I know we're buying a refrigerated van. We have it in the budget, in the school budget, not coming out of this line item, coming out of our line item. Um, and when I think about the replacement of uh, walk-in uh, freezers and uprights and, and uh, different ovens, which we know we've should be replacing periodically. I'm, I'm behind that. The thing that I don't understand, I come from the private sector. When you run a program and you lose money year in and year out, I don't care if you lose $1 or $15,000, you're losing money. When we go and get rid of an express line that makes, say, $500 a day or $500 here, there, and, and, and the profits there, I, I don't understand how we get rid of something that makes money and then all of a sudden, it just doesn't work in the private sector. I don't know how we're going to make it work in the public sector. It's nothing about, it's just, I'm very cautious because I've seen this district go into a deficit because of we want a Cadillac and we only could afford the full-size Chevy. And I think what, even when we do, and Terry's very uh, well involved with the new school, when we turn around and say we want all brand new computers, we want all brand new everything. 
And that's great, but to make it come under budget and on time, we do creative ways of cutting back on certain things and uh, to promote things that would bring the number up so we get what we call the balance on the balance sheet. So this is the cautious optimism that I have. When, when I went in and saw the choices that you're putting out with the fruit and the salads and everything, outstanding, commendable. Um, let's see how it works financially as we evolve into our new building and our new services because it just mathematically it's a little fuzzy for me. That's all I'm saying. I think it's absolutely a justified concern. I, and I've expressed, we all have expressed that, Sue's expressed that to me. I think the, had we been talking about this when the state came down and asked for this to happen, and we weren't gonna be moving into a new school, and I didn't know that layout, and I didn't know the flexibility that that was going to provide us, including to conceivably in a sense, potentially restore, in a sense, the a la carte, the way you and I think of it, it, it perhaps, uh, while maintaining this model that we have piloted here, um, we might be having a different discussion about what was happening at the high school right now. And, and Terry, I just, I, I want to commend the presentation. Good job enlightening the school committee on, on, on what you're doing and, and where we're headed. If this discussion would have taken place two weeks ago, I wouldn't have got complaints from parents when they discontinued the uh, express line because I could at least explain to the parents that this is what the plan is. But being on school committee and getting barraged with phone calls and kids coming up to you and, and that type of thing, the first thing you do is you say, why are we doing this mathematically? It doesn't balance. The quality's going down. But then now, as it explains, and, and I'm one of these guys, I'll go to the school, I'll have lunch, I'll witness what's going on so I can better represent people. Some people would call that an ethics violation. I call that representation. And I think that's what we have to do as a school committee member. And I thank you for the presentation tonight. Well, thank you. I agree. You may not thank me for the rest of the presentation, so. Because I'm, I'm going to bring back another oldie but goodie. Paid lunch equity. In your packets, in your, in your blue folders, there's a, I believe it was an August 17th memo I gave you to warn you of this day. Back in 2010, actually, is when the federal law changed and when a lot of this stuff came up, only the date that's coming up for it all to be implemented is July 1, 2012. Though paid lunch equity has actually been in place now for a couple of years. Basically, that fancy term for under the federal guidelines says that students paying for meals cannot pay less than the amount that is reimbursed by the federal government. It also says that you can't use federal funds, including commodities, to pay for or defray the cost, and that includes supplies, labor, service, of a paid meal. Now, I will tell you right now, um, state folks are gone, right? Okay, I will challenge the federal government, the state, or anybody else to uh, come down and prove to me what part of a commodity I have used to make a meal that I'm charging for. And when they can do that, fine. We'll figure out how to allocate that cost. But putting that aside, a little editorializing on my part, the current reimbursement rate is $2.46. Now, there is a provision in the law that allows the district to be below this amount for paid meals if it is making progress, meaning it's increasing at least 10% a year annually towards reaching that goal. Currently, we charge 50 cents for milk. We don't charge for an elementary breakfast. Middle high school breakfast is a dollar and adult breakfast is two. Elementary lunch is $1.75, middle high school lunch is two, and adult lunch is $3.75, and at Trinity lunch is $2. Here is what we are proposing. We are not asking you to vote on this tonight. We will put this as an action item for you to discuss and vote on at your next meeting. That milk remain at 50 cents. Elementary breakfast go to 50 cents. We're frankly out of compliance by not charging for elementary breakfast at all. We were always out of compliance there. Middle high school breakfast and really all of the rest of the meals, as you can see, basically go up a quarter. You would still not be at the reimbursable rate 
but you would meet the progress requirement. Um, and in your packets, I'm pretty sure towards the back, we gave you a survey of really the high school meals. Um, I will tell you that for the most part, you're gonna be in line. There are a couple there that are, are lower than we are, which surprised me. Um, they're gonna to have to do some serious work uh, because they're in the same boat we are. Because they also have to get to that $2.46 level. Um, one of the things I wanna stress, these price increases have nothing to do with that fund balance. They have nothing to do with the building project. They have everything to do with the federal government. And I do not want the public to believe that the school committee, you know, if and when whatever increase in school lunch prices it passes, is doing this because of the fund balance or because of the building project, because it has nothing to do with either. It is a requirement that is being mandated by the federal government. Have I made that clear? I think I'm all set. Thank you, Terry. Uh, actually, our former business manager, Courtney Keegan, ha had done a good job of educating us on the food, federal food process and the, the fact that we were going to have to bring those prices up. And that's why it was very hard a couple, like about a year ago when we did raise lunch prices to where they are currently and, and with the fact that we knew that we would have to do this incremental um, price increase. So, I mean, we have your recommendations and we'll put it on for the next meeting. Is there any further questions, comments? So uh, for the next meeting, then, we will put on for the food service summer program as well as the uh, lunch prices. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Sue. Thanks, Sue. Our next uh, presentation this evening is Grant's Classroom for Garden Butterflies with Ms. Frabata. Hello, Ms. Frabata. Welcome back every year, yeah, right? Yeah, well, you come last year. I'll make this brief. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, that's okay. <laughs> no, very brief. Um, the first one is I'm just presenting three grants from the um, Delta Kappa Gamma Society International, which has been very generous to Eastford Road School, and I'm a member of. The first one is Classroom to Garden Butterflies, which my kindergarten children worked on at the end of last year and throughout this year. And um, it blended math, ELA, and science into one cohesive whole. Um, the grant was $500, and the items purchased were a bird bath for the courtyard, a raised bed for a garden, seeds, an observation kit, a habitat kit, watering cans, a um, set of tools for the garden, um, a plastic life, si life cycle set of the butterfly and the caterpillar, and creating your own butterflies. The peaceful playground was this year. Um, this is for Eastford Road School, again, kindergarten and grade one. We received $2,100 for this grant. Um, the money was used to buy two crawl and climb caterpillars, one of which is on the blacktop for the children to enjoy, the other one on the playground. We got an, one Easy Ride Jumbo Wagon, which we used to transport all the materials to the blacktop area, the materials being the toys. Um, two Walk the Wave balance beams for coordination and balance for the children balls, all different kinds of sports balls, all different types that are evenly distributed between the playground as well as the blacktop area, and a basketball hoop. Um, the goals for these, or this peaceful playground program are gross motor, of course, exercise, socialization, and writing prompts. Um, these activities align with our NIAC in kindergarten, our NIAC standards, and they're great for indoor play, outdoor play, as well as recess. And the last grant that I will speak of is the Homeschool Connection, which I am trying to get for next year. Um, it's basically going to be a $1,400 grant, and it will be um, a homeschool partnership, basically um, to promote and enrich learning experiences at home. Um, basically, I will discuss with all the parents in my kindergarten classroom at conferences, 
um, through weekly newsletters, as well as orientation and kindergarten class day or graduation, how they will use these materials. And the materials will be distributed at open house to each parent. The materials that the children will receive, the $1,400 will pay for the children to take home in a tote bag, a paint set, colored pencils, scissors, glue, jumbo crayons, markers, Play-Doh, um, a design your own calendar which will align nicely with mathematical skills, as well as a calculator, a journal, and whiteboards. And um, basically, um, the best time will be at the beginning of the year to discuss this, how the children will use these materials throughout the course of the year. And at class day or graduation, I will go over with the parents how they can continue using these materials during the summer months so learning continues to go on so the children will be prepared for first grade. I'm just going to sneak in a couple things real quickly. We had a food drive at Eastford Road this year. We collected 12 bushel baskets of food and enough money for turkeys for each basket. And special thanks to the PTA for baskets and bows, as well as Amy Simos for taking the money and getting turkey certificates from the Big Bunny. We also had three family nights, which is huge. We had about 80 kindergarten and grade one students who attended all three of these family nights. We had a social studies night in the fall. We had a bingo night in the winter. And we had a feeling big family night in the spring. Um, for social studies and feeling big, the children worked on four selections of literature and they took home four activities which aligned with each selection of literature. Um, social studies and feeling big are a two-year program. Bingo night, we played 10 games of bingo. The theme was literacy. Um, the bingo games were based on ELA and our hot court reading series. Uh, for each of the family nights, the children took home a certificate of attendance, manipulatives, things that they made, as well as prizes at bingo night. And I just wanted to give a special thanks to the people that worked it, which would be Ms. Scripsack, of course, Mrs. Shaw, Mr. Latoy, Mrs. Wayman, Mrs. Hutchins, Mrs. Jositis, and Mrs. Trahan. And a very special thanks to my power, Mrs. Caroline Fontaine, because she helps me with all these nights. One quick thing um, is the leadership and Mrs. Shaw have um, a partnership with Hyde's now, and we've had, along with our three family nights, we've had two more nights, which is parent training, one in the area of math, and the second one will be Thursday night in ELA, where the kids take home um, samples of things they can work with at home, and the parents are trained on strategies and techniques to work with their children. We have one more coming up in the fall, which will be on behavior management. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fremont. Thanks for all you do. And I believe today is National Teachers Day, so to you and all the teachers in our district, uh, thank you for all the hard work that you do. Uh, we appreciate it, and you're all doing great things. It, Ms. Shaw, it's great that we have a partnership with Hyde's. It's, it's, it's nice that we see that Shot has pretty much partnership with Charlton Street, Hyde's with you, and it's become like a neighborhood concept, so that's great to see those partnerships in those areas. Don't know what might be up in the middle school, high school that we could partner with, but we'll try to find somebody. I will tell you that there's, a, there's one local bank that is, is already uh, has reached out to West Street, and they've been working with West Street, so I think soon we'll be able to announce a partnership with one of the local banks with West Street School. Great. Thank you. Thank you again. Uh, staffing updates, so Ms. Ealy? Just in the interest of time, over the last few months, we, we have ha we've had some staff turnover. It happens naturally throughout the year. Uh, I sent in your packet a, a list of people who are no longer with the school district uh, and a list of people who have been hired to replace those folks. Uh, so uh, I won't go through every name only because in the interest of time, uh, but in the near future I will be announcing uh, the, the total list of people who are retiring from the district who have given service to the district over the years and I want to do that on a separate evening, maybe at the next school committee meeting, where we can recognize their, their contributions to our school district. Uh, but you have an updated list as we speak, and that's actually already behind because I met with another new employee today. Uh, so I think uh, uh, we'll keep you up to date a little more often than, than this. Uh, but moving on to my report, in your packet, you have, I think, I'm going to say, I believe, the final version of the Southbridge Standard. I think if you had a chance to look at that, you'll see we took the input from the staff as well as you as school committee members. Uh, we have refashioned it a little bit in terms of how it's written. We actually changed the format a little bit. 
We've also really identified those seven things that we're looking for in every classroom and told, told the teachers what they are. We'll be publishing this to our teachers in the, in the very near future, probably this week. Uh, but I wanted you to know when we do our learning walks, these are the things we're looking for. Uh, we, uh, we go in and we actually document if we see these things present and then we feed back to the staff the things that we see, the actual numbers that we see. And we have heard a lot of positives from, from, uh, from this. The teachers really appreciate the fact that they know what we're looking for. Uh, and, and I think uh, we see more and more positive things happening at the classroom level, which is what the accelerated improvement plan was designed to do, which is really drill down to the classroom level to make sure things were, were getting better for teachers and kids. So the Southbridge standard kind of puts that in writing for everybody. So when we give a, hire a new teacher, we'll give them the Southbridge standard, and this is say, these are the expectations we have of you. Uh, so that there's nothing hidden, uh, and our parents will know what it is. It'll be published on our website, and it, it'll become the guiding document for us in terms of what we are doing when we do uh, staff evaluations and when we go out to hire people. Can they do these things? So that's what the Southbridge Standard is all about. Uh, I wanted to add one thing that, that kind of came up recently which has been in the news and, 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 and we, we've sent some things out and been on our website. We had a, a, a slight mercury spill and I will say slight because it was slight uh, by, by anybody's standards except basically the EPA uh, and everything's major to them. So uh, when you have mercury in a building, as we all used to probably is, at, everybody sitting at this table other than the young lady at the end probably played with mercury in science class. Uh, that's back in the good old days when you could do that. <laughs> Nowadays, it's a little more serious than that. Uh, we had a slight accident, uh, not really anybody's fault. Uh, we had a young man helping a teacher as we like to see happen, and uh, a, a thermometer that nobody knew was there fell uh, out of the bottom of something and broke on the floor, and a little bit of mercury came out, less than the size of an eraser head on a, on, a, on a pencil. But that was enough to bring out, it seemed like, the National Guard. Uh, uh, but in the end, I gotta tell you, our teachers, our kids, the community agencies that were involved, the police, the fire department, Everybody handled this as well as it could possibly be handled. I've been told by any number of agencies and, and uh, the fire department and people within uh, this field that we handled it as well or better than anybody they've ever seen. And that's a testament to our building administration, the teachers, the building community, the parents. Uh, I think everybody involved handled this exactly the way it should have been handled. You have in your packet tonight, or it was laying on your, on your, uh, your seat tonight, uh, sort of a final report from the cleanup of that. Uh, I believe the room is now open for use. Uh, maybe it's, it may be one stage away from being open for use. Uh, the, the, uh, the hazmat TV, well, the hazardous materials folks took most of this, but we did find out a lot about this process. So I guess when mercury hits the floor, it absorbs into some of the floor tiles. They have to come in and they have to put down some kind of a material that pulls it out. We didn't have to tear the floor up or anything, but it pulls it out, then you clean that mess up, and then you dispose of that properly. And, and that's where we're, we're at the point now where we're getting ready to reopen that room. Uh, it happened actually in a storage room, not in a classroom. There was never, never any contamination outside of that storage room. Just as a precaution, they asked us not to use that classroom until the storage room was cleaned up. So the staff handled it very, very well, and, and I appreciate uh, all the, the positive that we got back from our community on that. Yes? Mr. Lazar? Um, <clears throat> I, I heard nothing but positive. Um, my, my concern was, um, our former department head of the science was Dave Williams, who was instructed and leaded, led up uh, headed up, I should say, um, the group and the company that cleaned out all of the chemicals and hazardous stuff out of the system. I think what was kind of disheartening is he was in the Southbridge News basically saying, oh, geez, you know, I might have a few more of those in my, in my room. I took offense to that because I understand the kids are kids and, they're gonna, and things are going to happen, but we're talking about a stipend department head that was in charge of getting rid of it in the first place five years ago with a hazardous company, hazardous waste company. 
And now we're sitting here saying he's, on, he's in the newspaper say, stating this, so I think maybe we should sit down uh, entering the new building and say, with the new science department head that we have, can we go through these things before we move into the high school so we meet the code and, and put it in some hands uh, that, that can handle it, you know? We've already done that with, with uh, it's, we've gone through the building again Good. and we'll go through the high school. We've had that conversation because what happens is the rules change on what you're allowed to have in a science lab at the high school level. You used to be allowed to have phosphorus, you can't have phosphorus anymore. You used to be allowed to have white phosphorus, you can't have white phosphorus anymore. Some has to be in oil, some has to be in water. All those things have been removed to the best of our knowledge. But Occasionally things get hidden in the bottom of a box. Those kind of things do happen, and that's what occurred in this situation. So we certainly have, have uh, made a conscious decision to make sure we go double-check everything again. Thank you. Thank you. Anything further? Mr. I do not have anything further. Business manager, do you have anything to report? Thank you. School committee actions. We have no school committee actions this evening. Unfinished business, district reconfiguration. Mr. Ely, did you have anything to add for this evening? Uh, I met with the elementary principals today. Uh, we have identified and we've notified the staff members uh, that will be in each building where they will be. Uh, the principals, I believe, I'm not 100% sure, but I believe the principals have identified the classroom specific to the teacher. So they're communicating that to the teachers. Uh, we talked today about getting the boxes ready to start packing things up and We've, our maintenance department, and I know Terry has met with a number of different uh, uh, moving companies to kind of get an idea of what we need to do. Uh, so that progress is well on its way. I apologize. There should have been an action tonight for you to adopt the, uh, the lines as we recommended. And that action is not on the agenda, but I would ask that you consider waiving the rules and, and pass the, the, those boundaries because I need to notify parents and I don't feel comfortable doing that until you've adopted the, the actual boundary lines. And just so you know, I have had no, no, nobody come into my office or call to complain about the boundary lines that we've proposed. The street listings, however, have been up on our website. Okay. All right, um, is there a motion to waive the rules and under unfinished business to add, uh, to adopt the boundary lines as presented by the superintendent of schools? So moved, Mr. Chairman. Is there a, okay. Roll call. Dr. Domenico? Mr. Jovian? Yes. Mr. Lazo? Yes. Dr. O'Leary? Mrs. Principe? Yes. Mrs. Woodrow? Yes. Mr. DiGregorio? Yes. Seven yes. Okay, the motion is to vote to adopt the boundary lines as presented by the superintendent of schools. Second. Okay. Any discussion on those boundary lines? There's a map out in the lobby. It's been there since day one, and we've had the, uh, we tried to get the map put into a, a picture so it can get onto the website, but it, we're not able to get it there so you can read it. it we're just not being able to get it on there, and, and there's no electronic map of town that allows us to do that, that we've been able to track down. But what we will do, if you, if you pass this, these lines, we will send a letter to every parent that lets them know where, the, where they're at, yes. Any further discussion? Seeing none, roll call. Mr. Jovian? Yes. Mr. Lazo? Yes. Dr. O'Leary? Yes. Mrs. Principe? Yes. Mrs. Woodruff? Yes. Mr. DiGregorio? Yes. Dr. Domenico? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Unanimous fall present. The Committee on the Maintenance Department, Mr. Lazo? Uh, no report at this time. Thank you. Uh, accelerated Improvement Plan, we've already discussed. I don't think there's anything further we need to discuss no. on that. Okay. And we do have a sign in the custodial collective bargaining agreement. This is uh, just the integral, integrated contract. Did you have a copy that they already signed? No, actually, I, I, we had invited the... Well, Ernie was here, but he said that he had already signed a copy, that they had I, already signed it? No, I'm not aware right. that they have signed a copy. They, they well, signed the MOU. They did okay. not sign the actual well, integrated... We'll if you sign it, if you sign it we'll, get, we'll get it signed by them. All right, we'll, just, we'll sign uh, two agreements and have them sign both, yep. please. That would, be, that would be acceptable. You want to use mine? Yeah. 
just for the public, this was already a negotiated agreement. We had sent the information to our attorney for the form, and this is just the completed form uh, as to the negotiated instrument. And it's for the year of July 1st, 2011 to June 30th, 2014. Moving on under new business, the next regular school committee meeting will be held on May 22nd, 2012 in council chambers. One item of new business, um, just looking at upcoming meetings scheduled through June 2012, we had talked about this earlier in the year, but we do need to move our last meeting of the year as it uh, falls on the town election date of June 26, 2012. Usually we have to take up some items on that meeting, so we'll look to either move it to uh, Wednesday or the Monday before, depending on town council uh, meetings. Okay, any further new business from anyone? Seeing none, school committee reports, curriculum subcommittee. Mr. DiGregorio. Nothing to report, and we're still looking to schedule a meeting to discuss uh, the state's take on uh, the teaching of both evolution and creation as uh, uh, part of the curriculum. Thank you. Policy, Mrs. Woodruff. Nothing to report, and nothing Budget, facilities, transportation, Ms. Dr. Domenico. Nothing to report, nothing scheduled. And like we said earlier, we will schedule a committee meeting of the whole to take up any budgetary adjustments that we have to make based on the town council's vote that they take. Um, again, um, the town is looking to cut the school committee recommended budget by approximately $700,000 from our uh, recommended increase for next year. Um, so if anybody has any questions, I would urge you to go to the town council meeting to advocate for any additional funds, as it will impact uh, staffing and some of the programs that we do have. Collective bargaining subcommittee, Mr. Lazo. No report at this time. Okay. School I, uh, building committee. Yeah, um, I'd just like to comment that uh, the tours are bigger and larger than ever. Um, we also did some special tours for the upward bound kids that uh, toured the new high, middle high school. We also took the realtors through. Um, they were electrified with what they saw. The pace that Casigli Construction is at is unprecedented. Uh, in a, in a three-day span or a five-day span, the progress is, is unbelievable. Um, uh, some of the things that are, that are, that are coming full turn, uh, we have a lot of outreach uh, from from my district and I think there are groups that want to donate things to the new school and um, we are working on some of the donations uh, some of them want to put some uh, gardening things uh, around the building we're going to wait till the landscaping's done we think we're going to do some of the add-ons to the landscape of the high school through some of the volunteers uh, such as the Lions Club have stepped forward uh, the class of 1950 uh, they want to do something a tribute to Mary Wells on site. Um, we have a family that wants to donate something to the music department in uh, memory of their son. Uh, we have a tremendous amount of electricity, positive stuff that's happening in the town of Southbridge. When the realtors come up to you and they say, we can finally market Southbridge, because the first question when they buy a home is, how are the schools? We had a, uh, recently a doctor tour the school to find out if he's going to live in Southbridge. And after he saw the school, he says, I will be buying my home here. This is where I'm going to be working. So I think that we have parents and students that tour the school that are up for school choice that are no longer opting for, opting for school choice. So I think we're, uh, we're seeing the tip of the iceberg. And I think uh, the philosophy, 13 years old, build it and they shall come uh, or they will stay. Um, is going to be an exciting time for the town of Southbridge as we move forward. We're on time, under budget. I know everybody's been hearing that. It's a remarkable thing that uh, some people were talking about a, uh, a technology grant or a technology uh, purchase, I should say, and uh, they were throwing all kinds of numbers out there. If, if there's anybody that has a question about the new school, please feel free. Terry Wiggins is one guy that's been working these numbers on a lot of the procurement along with the superintendent. Myself or Jack Jovan, if you have a question, ask. Um, it will be under budget. We are adjusting as we go down to the finish line on what we're doing in that building to make sure it is under budget and that we hold our word on what we told the public. So I think there are some uh, rumors flying around that are, are fictitious. 
Uh, I heard one that the new high school is settling. I, I don't know where that came from, but I want you to know that it's been tested, monitored, the oversight and accountability by the OPM and, and the oversight and the eyes that, and the ears that we have on site um, on the weekly meetings. We know that we have one solid building that's going to be on time and on the budget, but it's your school. You want to see it. Call. We'll meet you on site. We can do smaller tours, which are better, uh, but we have our monthly every third Saturday, and uh, the last one was over 50 people, and uh, it was nice to see the, the excitement from the public. And uh, there are things that we will be working on, such as the nurses' situation uh, and the, the counselors, uh, guidance counselors, and various other things, which is not a building committee uh, issue. It is an administrative and school committee issue. So I think that uh, we are all in the same boat, and the concerns about any consolidation has to be vetted out before we make a consolidation. And I think that uh, our superintendent and school committee are working together on everything that we're working on, and it looks good. Thank you. Thank you. There is no executive session this evening. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. All those in favor? Nana, all present. <laughs> Thank you, and have a good evening. <laughs>